Uh, hi, everyone. Today we have Will Merrill here on the expressive power of transformers with Chain of Thought, um, uh, the work together with Ashish Savaror. And um, yeah, Will has been here a couple of times and has been an organizer of FLAN, and we're excited to have you back, Will. Um, thank you for being here, and you can take it from here. Cool. Thanks, Lena. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be talking about this paper, which appeared at iClear. Um, and there was joint work with Ashish. Um, so basically the motivation for this paper is that, also, can you guys see the slides okay? Like the zoom overlay isn't covering anything? Okay, great. Um, so the motivation for this paper is that uh, in a lot of past work, um, we and other people have looked at the expressive power of transformers. Um, of course, I probably don't need to introduce this line of work to people here. Um, one of the, main takeaways from this line of work is that if you have transformers with soft attention and you use them as a classifier where you pass in the input and you expect them to return the answer to a decision problem, um, they basically can only express functions in this complexity class called TC0. And this implies that um, in some sense, they're limited reasoners because there's lots of types of computation that we know is outside TC0, such as simulating automata, state tracking, or solving graph connectivity questions um, that shouldn't be expressible by the models. Now, in practice, um, you know, people don't always use transformers as classifiers. And in fact, um, uh, specifically on reasoning problems, um, one way that there are that transformers are often used is with a chain of thought or a scratch pad, which is basically um, allowing the model to generate extra tokens and perform extra computation. And empirically, this can often boost performance. So for example, um, here's a, this is from the Scratchpad paper, uh, Naya et al. Uh, in order to evaluate synthetic Python programs, they basically allow the model to generate um, intermediate tokens and then further condition on those tokens. And that uh, improves the accuracy quite a bit. So you can see that in the table, table two. And then the other, uh, kind of at the same time as the scratch thread paper, this chain of thought paper came out and they uh, made plots like this where basically the blue curve shows the transformer with chain of thought and the black curve shows the transformer without chain of thought. And on uh, several of these benchmarks or on this uh, GSM 8K benchmark for several different models, uh, chain of thought boosts the, the reasoning performance of the model. So these are empirical findings. Um, but the point of this paper is kind of, we want to reconcile the uh, what we know about transformers being quite limited when they're used as classifiers with the fact that um, in practice, chain of thought seems to be like a, a beneficial um, uh, thing to add to transformers. And one hypothesis for why this is the case is that maybe adding a chain of thought gets around some of the expressiveness limitations that transformers have uh, without chain of thought. So that's the hypothesis motivating this work. We want to understand formally, uh, does chain of thought actually increase the expressive power? And specifically, um, the question we ask is, does the expressive power of transformers increase as you add uh, T steps of chain of thought? So chain of thought, you know, you could imagine allowing the model to uh, generate different amounts of tokens. And this is only a well-defined question if you kind of capture the amount of chain of thought you're adding as some kind of resource. So I'm gonna use this notation big T to represent the number of chain of thought steps. And then we want um, a result that basically tells us how much power we get depending on how many steps, how large T is. Um, and just to clarify what I mean by chain of thought, so we're all on the same page um, because this term is maybe somewhat overloaded. All I mean by chain of thought is that a transformer can generate um, intermediate tokens before answering, and the number of tokens that it can, can generate is T. So for example, if we have the input, what is two plus two minus one, kind of similar to this uh, Python evaluation task on the previous slide, uh, the transformer would first encode this, or would first predict the token, um, let's say it predicts two, then this would be interpreted as a chain of thought token that gets added back to the input, and then the model can predict another token and so on and so on um, until eventually we get to the final answer. So all of these orange tokens here would be the chain of thought tokens 
and T would be the number of those tokens that you're allowed to generate. And then finally, after you exhaust the T chain of thought tokens, we interpret the final token or, you know, final couple tokens as an answer. Any questions about the setup before I move on? No? Okay, great. So that's that's the setup. Um, and of course, this is different than uh, the setup that's been analyzed in the past, where basically, um, oops, sorry. Um, okay, so anyway, what, what results do we have? Um, we basically res uh, relate these uh, chain of thought transformers to Turing machines and specifically to Turing machine time and space complexity classes. And the reason this is useful is, it because, is because we know a lot of things about Turing machines and the type of uh, problems that can be expressed by Turing machines with different amounts of resources. So in order to understand uh, chain of thought steps as a resource, we can kind of just think about them in terms of Turing machine steps. That's one of the um, you know, main takeaways we have from this paper. So specifically, um, there are three main results. One is what we call a lower bound. So um, basically this says that if you have a, uh, if you have a trans transformer with um, T chain of thought steps that can simulate anything that a Turing machine could do with these steps. And in the other direction, um, we see that a uh, transformer with T steps can be simulated by a transformer or by a Turing machine with roughly T squared steps. Um, so this is a upper bound in terms of a time complexity class. And then we also have a third result, which is an upper bound in terms of the space complexity class, which is that um, a transformer with T-chain and thought steps can be simulated roughly by a um, string machine with T uh, space. So I'm first going to talk about these upper bound results. Um, I think these are fairly straightforward. Um, but it's kind of useful to get a result on both sides of the um, of the COT class to get a you know containment in, in two directions, um, and then I'll focus more on this lower bound construction because I think that there's a lot more details going on here and a lot more um, interesting uh, things to discuss for for this audience. So anyway, the the high level picture that emerges from all these results is. Yeah, again, it allows us to understand the expressive power of transformers with chain of thought in terms of what we already know about um, Turing machines. And also, once I discuss these results, I'll talk about some specific implications, such as like what this means about simulating automata or solving problems like graph connectivity, and um, when we actually get more expressive power compared to transformers without chain of thought. So let's start with the upper bounds. The first result is um, that I'll talk about is this one, which is saying that um, basically T steps of chain of thought is uh, can be simulated by a Turing machine with T squared steps. And I guess I'll ask the audience: Does anyone have any intuition for why this is true or where this result comes from? Uh, okay. So no. I guess can the, I can I can yeah. say that. So Erlen, are you saying something? Oh no, I said if you can give us an intuition. Give... Sorry? I was asking if you can give us an intuition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um so I guess the intu one one way to one hint about this is that um basically to run attention, um, it's a quadratic computation. So if you wanna uh, implement attention in serial, you need to, at each token, iterate over all of the previous token. And this is token, and this is roughly like a n-squared operation. So if you have t steps of um, chain of thought, then in the worst case, at, at the tth uh, step, you'll need to do roughly t-squared. Or you'll need to do two t, iterate over t numbers at the tth step, and that corresponds to like a t-squared amount of work that you need to do. Um, so that's where this result comes from. It's basically just, you know, how the transformer architecture is defined and how attention is designed. And it's, you know, the whole reason why attention becomes um, kind of slow at longer context lengths. Um, so that's that's all this result is saying, but it's a useful baseline to have in mind 
um, because it gives us an upper bound on how powerful a uh, chain of thought step could be. Yeah, so that's basically what I said. Um, the other upper bound is a little bit more complicated to, to derive. So this the previous one was in terms of uh, time complexity, and this one is in terms of space complexity. So it might seem a bit weird um, to be relating chain of thought steps to a space complexity class because these chain of thought steps correspond more to runtime, like they're they're a step of computation, and therefore they map cleanly onto maybe like the number of steps the Turing machine has to take um, rather than the amount of space it has. But um, this actually falls out from our previous results about transformers with um, without chain of thought. And the reason for this is, um, well, okay. Basically, uh, one individual token can be computed in TC0. And we know that TC0 is a subset of log space. So that means that one individual token as a function of all of the previous inputs um, can be computed in log space. And that means all we need to do is kind of store a buffer of all the tokens. Um, so that's a buffer of size roughly T. And then we have maybe log N overhead on top of that um, to simulate some kind of TC0 circuit that um, that executes all of the, you know, the current step of the computation produces a new token and adds that to the buffer. So this would be a really inefficient way to simulate a transformer. It would um, involve basically not caching inter any intermediate computation, but just computing each token as a function of the previous tokens, throwing out all of the hidden states that you, that you have, and just adding the, the output token back to the input buffer, and then repeating this process like until you um, get T tokens. But in principle, it shows that um, you know, you could simulate a transformer uh, with T plus log N space overhead. Yeah. So that's those are the two upper bounds. Um, and those kind of serve as a baseline for how much chain of thought could add. Um, but the big focus of this paper was on the other direction, which is the, um, the lower bound direction. And um, Actually, I should pause for questions before I move to this. Does anyone have any questions about the either of the two upper bounds? So, Will, does it make sense to ask for a space lower bound? A space lower bound. So is there a space complexity class where uh, any problem in that class could be solved by a uh, chain of thought transformer? I mean, I guess it's well-defined. I don't have any... Um, I think I don't think there is such a class that uh, we could prove anything about, and the reason for that is because if you have like a, a constant space class, that would be like finite state machines, basically, and we know that that would be incomparable with um, uh, hmm. oh no, I, yeah, okay, actually, I don't know, I don't have a good answer, maybe. Maybe it would, if T gets large enough, maybe you could prove something like this, but at least um, for small T, I feel like even um, a constant space class would be incomparable. Uh -huh. Yeah. Thanks. Um, okay. So I'll move on to the, to the lower bounds. Okay. So basically the goal of our lower bound result is to show that um, basically with one step of chain of thought, you can simulate one step of a Turing machine, which means if you um, grow, you know, T steps of chain of thought, you basically get um, at, at least uh, time T as, as a lower bound. So the idea behind this construction is similar to um, the paper attention is Turing complete. Um, except that their model makes a couple simplifying assumptions about how um, transformers work. And it's also for encoder decoder um, models, whereas we're working with um, basically causally masked transformers. So that's a slightly different architecture compared to encoder decoder models. And we try to get rid of some of the simplifying assumptions in their construction. 
So specifically, their construction assumed was, uh, that the positional encodings included three different values, n, 1 over n, and 1 over n squared, and used these numbers to route information appropriately. And um, they also had a kind of non-standard absolute value attention um, for how they can compare keys and queries. And also, uh, yeah, so I guess they didn't have layer norm in their model either. So the high level idea of our construction is pretty similar to theirs. Um, the invariance and the construction is that basically uh, chain of thought step T stores um, an update uh, written uh, by the Turing machine to the tape at time T at whatever position it was at. So rather than like an RNN style Turing completeness construction where the current uh, state needs to encode all of the information on the tape and some kind of fractal representation. For this kind of construction, we actually have a distributed representation of the tape. Um, we're gonna write basically all the updates that happen locally, and then we're gonna use attention to always reconstruct the part of the tape that we need um, by summing appropriate um, things, basically. And the construction um, that achieves this invariant is as follows. So at each token i, the first step is going to be to reconstruct the current tape position by counting. And I'll go over this in a lot more detail, but this is just um, pass one to give you some, some high level intuition. So that's the first step. We're going to find what position we're currently at. Then um, token i is going to attend back in time to the last time we were at this position. And it's going to read out whatever update was made on the tape to figure out what the current symbol on the tape is. Because if you find the most recent update to the current position, you can uh, basically know what's currently on the tape. So at that point, we have what's on the tape. And we also have um, the current finite state, which gets passed basically through the input. And um, that's all we need to compute the transition function and write a new update onto the tape. So the crucial thing we're relying on here is um, that when we write an update onto the tape, it kind of gets propagated back to the input and creates this uh, recurrent dependency in the computation graph. So if you don't have this property where you can write outputs that go back to the input, you can't achieve this construction. And that's crucially why um, chain of thought is helpful. So I'll talk about step one. So how is it that we can reconstruct the current tape position? Um, this takes advantage of counting, which is like a pretty you know, fundamental primitive in a lot of transformer constructions. So the idea is that the input tokens um, in this construction are basically encoding the moves made by the Turing machine. So this includes basically what finite state we're in and also whether we move uh, right or left uh, at the previous token. So for example, um, let's say the input tokens are as, far, are as written here. Uh, the first step is that we want to we want to use an attention head to reconstruct the current position. And we do this by having the value represent whether we're at a right or left move in the attention head. So here would be the values. We get basically a plus one at a right move and a minus one at a left move. And then if we sum over um, all of these previous uh, values to the left, um, we can basically reconstruct the current position. So it gets encoded as a fraction because of how attention works, but it basically gives us something like this. And you may notice that uh, we're assuming something called strict causal masking here, where basically you only attend to things uh, to your left, not to your left up to you. Um, so that is that is an assumption we're making that is typically not uh, used in, in practice. But um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll go over a couple of the different you know, uh, details like that at the end of the construction. Any questions about this? No, okay. So the point of this is basically to get the current position on the tape, which is the first thing that we need to um, retrieve the current state uh, of the tape. And then step two is that we actually want to attend back in time and retrieve the last time we were at this position and figure out what was written there. So we're gonna look back at the last time we were at this position and we're gonna retrieve um, basically whatever was written out onto the tape at that time. 
So intuitively, this might be kind of hard. And when we started thinking through this paper, we weren't sure it was possible because you're not comparing, um, you know, the number one against the number one. Uh, in this example, you're comparing one over one against one third. So the fact that this denominator evolves over time because of strict causal masking or because of just causal masking in general means that it may be difficult to compare these um, tape positions for equality. But it turns out that there is a nice way to use layer norm um, to get around this challenge actually. So we introduced this little gadget that we call the layer norm hash that basically allows us to match these denominators and hard attend to the last time that we were at the current position. So what is this layer norm hash? Um, layer norm hash is a function defined like this. So uh, we write it as five xi, and um, it basically gives us uh, this uh, value. So we're, basically all we're doing is we're projecting x and i onto the, the unit sphere, and um, we throw in the negative x and the negative i there because uh, layer norm technically like makes the input, it normalizes the input to be mean zero. So if we uh, construct the vector to be mean zero, um, it, it simplifies a lot of the, the analysis and makes, makes it so that we don't have to worry about that aspect of what we And why is this useful? Um, well, there's two properties here that are useful. So one is if you pass in X over I and one over I to uh, layer norm, it gives you something that doesn't depend on i. Um, so basically it gives you a representation of just x, this like five x comma one, and it's basically scale invariant to this denominator i. And the intuition for this is that this function is basically projecting its inputs onto the unit sphere. So if um, you know both inputs are divided by i, i doesn't have any effect. So that's a nice property. Um, you can kind of see that it's gonna give us something that only captures the numerator, not the denominator. And the second nice property is that if you take the inner product between uh, this represent representation of x and this representation of y, it'll be maximized exactly when x equals y. So if we're hard attending and we assume that the temperature is high enough that we're basically going to put all of the attention weight onto the maximal um, like key query match, then this function will basically pick out exactly um, you know, the indices that have the same numerator as the current um, the current uh, query. So um, to write that out more concretely, this is the type of attention pattern we would use to retrieve um, the last time we were at the current tape position, uh, HI, using the Leonor hash. So I would say like this is, a useful tool in this Turing machine construction, but it also seems pretty um, useful in general for if you ever want to uh, route information in a causally mass transformer. So in the literature, there's some work that uses some, uses ideas like this to um, recognize uh, bounded depth dike languages, for example. So this paper from Chen Yu Yao et al. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, they don't write it exactly in these terms, but it uses a similar idea and probably you could refactor their proof to use like our notation and this like layer norm hash idea as a, as a module. Um, and I guess, yeah, we've also thought about some other contexts where it might be useful, um, like going from bounded depth like language recognition to um, unbounded depth like language recognition. It seems like the layer norm hash could be useful to implement some of the attention patterns you need there as well. Um, any questions about this? I know there's a lot of equations on this slide. No? Okay. So that's step two of the construction. So just to recap, step one was to figure out the current position on the tape. And then step two was to use the current position to figure out um, the tape contents. So now we're in a position where we have the contents of the current tape cell, and we have the current finite state. Um, and in a Turing machine, that's all you need to compute the transition function and figure out um, you know, the next update to the state. 
the tape. So we can basically use a feed forward layer to do this because it's just a finite lookup table. And then we can write out um, the whole output of the transition function, but basically the, the delta that it gives us. Um, and recall that our invariant in this construction was that the tokens that we're adding in the chain of thought stream are going to encode um, the sequence of diffs made to the Turing machine tape. So basically that completes the proof and allows us to um, yeah, write out the next dip on the tape. So I said that there's um, a couple different caveats about this construction. Um, it does get rid of some of the simplifying assumptions from password, but it also still is uh, relies on a couple of things. So the first is that it relies on saturated attention, meaning that, um, or averaging hard attention, meaning that uh, we assume that when you have your keys and queries, you don't use softmax to decide how much uh, weight to put on each one. You put all the probability on the ones that are strictly the argmax. And if there's multiple, you tie between them. Um, so it'd be interesting to see whether, uh, I think some people here probably, ha probably have thoughts about this and understand better than I do, um, whether this could be generalized to um, the soft attention case. Um, and then the second simplifying assumption is that, again, we have strict causal masking instead of normal causal masking, meaning that you don't attend to the current token. I think probably this is a minor assumption and maybe could be removed um, if people look into it. So that could be an interesting um, thing to think about in the future. And then finally, um, one detail I gloss over, which is important, is that we have this uh, masked uh, pre-norm going on. So um, actually, yeah, I think David was the, and Andy were the ones who uh, realized that this was necessary when they read the preprint for the paper. Um, so you need to actually have a linear projection before layer norm to implement some of the, um, the operations that are needed, some of the low-level operations that are needed in this construction. Um, and the intuition for this is that basically you want to take layer norms of specific features, you don't want to take layer norm of the whole feature vector. And having a linear projection before you apply layer norm allows you to mask out some of those features that you don't want to include in your layer norm and just take layer norm of a couple um, individual features. So I think this may actually be necessary for the construction to go through. And it might actually be interesting to see whether adding this uh, linear projection to transformers uh, would be useful or, you know, would even be like, like good from an optimization perspective, um, because it seems like a very minimal change to the architecture that probably wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't add any significant overhead and it probably wouldn't um, degrade performance. And maybe, you know, based on this theory, we have a reason to think that it would help um, in some cases. So I think that would be like an interesting experimental, um, like, potential you know, experiments to run in the future. Sorry, I have a question here. Yeah. Um, so in saturated attention, if you have multiple previous positions, you say your attention will average in these uh, values on this position. But uh, I think in Turing machine, we only need the last value at that position, right? How do you do that? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So I also glossed over this. Um, right. That's a good. That's a good point. So based on the layer norm hash idea that I talked about, we would basically attend to all of the previous um, position rights to the current position, but we actually have to add a tie breaking term that upweights the ones that are more recent, um, as opposed to the ones that are further in the past. And this actually turned out to be really complicated. Um, the details for the construction are in the paper, but um, basically you need to add a little bit of um, weight that is like monotonically increasing with um, with with n, so that the larger ends get more weight and they break the tie. Yeah. Okay. So that's. The caveats uh, to the result. I guess I'll talk a little bit about some of the, the implications that emerge from this. So again, like the generic result just gives us a characterization of expressive power based on um, T, the number of steps. 
And then it's interesting to think about what happens when you instantiate T with specific functions. So for example, we could let T be like uh, a linear function of N. And in this case, we actually see that transformers um, are able to solve some NC1 complete problems. So one, some problems that are likely not in TC0. So one example of this is if you can simulate, if you have N uh, COT steps, you can simulate a Turing machine for N steps. And this means you can simulate a finite state machine um, and you can solve state tracking problems, which are NC1 complete. Um, another example, which was proved um, as a special case in concurrent work to us was this Boolean formula evaluation problem. So with a linear number of chain of th uh, thought steps, you can evaluate Boolean formulas. And this is another problem that's NC1 complete. So this gives us you know, a couple examples where once you get to a linear number of steps, you clearly can do stuff that you could not do without any chain of thought. Um, there's an interesting question, which is what happens before you have a linear number of steps? Like let's say you had log n, uh, if t was log n, if you had log n chain of thought steps, um, would that increase the power of the, the transformer at all? Or would you remain um, you know, only able to express computation in TC0? We don't have any examples of problems uh, that, that we can prove log n chain of thought turn, uh, transformers could express outside TC0, but we also don't have a proof that they're bounded in TC0. So it's a bit of an open question, but uh, yeah, definitely it seems like our, our conjecture at least is that maybe a linear number of steps is required to get any expressivity gain from chain of thought. So I think this is another place where um, having a more refined result in future work would be pretty interesting. Um, you can also go beyond linear steps. So I guess so far what I've said is that if you have sublinear steps, we don't know that you don't gain power, but it seems like you probably don't. Um, I guess in the paper we also, well, we do know based on the results that at most you would get to log space if you had log n steps, but log space is still more powerful than TC0. So I guess it's unclear uh, yeah, there like what the whether there's a tighter upper bound, but um, you can also increase the the number of steps beyond uh, linear, and in general, if you do this, uh, you're going to get more power beyond like automata or Boolean formulas. So specifically, if you have something like n squared uh, COT steps, you can start to solve uh, graph connectivity by uh, running like the standard algorithms for for solving graph connectivity. And I guess if you are familiar with the literature on graph connectivity, um, the algorithms to solve graph connectivity are typically described as taking a linear um, amount of time in the input graph. So like, for example, if you want to run depth first search on a graph to determine connectivity, that takes a linear amount of space in the um, number of nodes. So it might be a little confusing why we have this n squared result here. The reason for that is because graph connectivity algorithms are only linear if you're running on like a, a RAM model of computation. Where, but if you're running on a multi-tape Turing machine, there's actually like a quadratic overhead to translate these like RAM programs into um, like multi-tape Turing machine programs. So you actually, in the worst case, might need more uh, steps than you would otherwise. So that's why this is an example of a problem that might take more than a linear number of steps. Um, if, you have, if you have like algorithms that take some uh, polynomial number of Turing machine steps, for example, like CKY parsing or something, you can translate that also to an equivalent, equivalent um, characterization in terms of COT steps using our result. And then in general, if you allow um, a polynomial an arbitrary polynomial number of COT steps, you would eventually converge to capture all polynomial time. So, you know, just like there's like a, a time hierarchy for like Turing machine, like time classes. Um, and as you increase the amount of, uh, you know, the degree of the polynomial, you get more um, expressive power. The same thing basically holds for uh, COT steps. So yeah, I guess that's um, some of the most of the specific stuff I wanted to talk about. I guess to go a little bit more high level, 
Um, the main contributions we had in this work were showing basically upper and lower bounds on transformers with chain of thought. And these upper bounds and lower bounds depend on the number of steps, which basically allows us to treat the COT step, uh, the number of COT steps as a computational resource, kind of akin to time or space on a Turing machine. And we had results that mapped, um, you know, uh, that resource to these other resources that we understand better. Um, I guess, as Dana said, we don't have a lower bound for space, but that, that would be interesting um, to think about. Um, so crucially, it seems like there's a gain in power around a linear number of steps um, that corresponds to being able to simulate automata or state tracking kind of stuff. Um, although we haven't, there, I guess there is an open question. It, it is possible that before linear number of steps, you could um, gain power, but we don't have any examples of that. Um, and again, once you get up to polynom uh, polynomial number of steps, you can capture all of P, although a polynomial number of steps is a lot of steps. Um, so another interesting takeaway from this work that I haven't mentioned yet is um, that maybe, you know, there are other ways to extend the expressive power of transformers that are more efficient than chain of thought in some sense. So like if you want to, if you want to use a linear number of chain of thought steps, it's actually a lot of work to be doing, especially because the runtime scales quadratically with the number of steps. So, you know, maybe there are better ways to do this. So one example would be like universal transformers where you grow the depth of the model rather than growing the number of tokens. And, um, you know, we think some of these problems might be solvable with like log depth, for example, rather than linear um, serial COT steps. Another example would be, um, I guess we have this work that came out after this paper on state space models and how maybe you can just change the architecture of the state space model to make it um, more expressive than TC0, even with a constant number of layers. So both of these would be ways to achieve greater expressive power that don't require you to do a lot of additional wasteful computation. And um, yeah, I guess the, the results in this paper kind of set the stage for thinking about these other things that might be more efficient. Um, some of the other takeaways from this paper that I wanted to highlight were, were um, I guess, the layer norm hash, which I talked about. I think this was uh, kind of a fun uh, tool that we had in some in the proofs, and it might be useful in like similar work that other people do. Um, so I wanted to highlight it for this audience. And then also, um, I guess this masked pre-norm idea seems um, interesting. And I guess, I don't know if anyone has trained models with this type of architecture, but if so, I'd be curious to hear about that. And um, yeah, I guess also, I'm not 100% sure that it's necessary to make the results go through, but it seems like it is. And uh, yeah. And finally, a couple of open questions. So I think on the expressivity side, uh, having a more general result or kind of figuring out whether some of the assumptions we made are necessary would be interesting. Um, specifically, I think seeing whether you could generalize the result to go through without saturated attention. And on the learnability side, I guess one of the uh, potentially misleading things about these lower bounds is that you don't know whether they're actually achievable if you train a model with gradient descent. So, um, for example, I don't know whether if you train a, uh, a transformer, um, it would learn something like our Turing machine construction or whether that construction is even like possible to learn. And maybe, you know, it could be that you need some kind of fancy training to learn this, like um, so that the model can back propagate from uh, across like sampling a token, which is a non-differentiable operation. So it seems like maybe R, like in principle, RL could help learn this kind of construction if um, maximum likelihood alone couldn't teach it to you. And I think there's some interesting experimental questions to ask around that. So yeah, um, that's all I had. Thanks for, uh, for attending. Happy to take questions now. Yeah.